going to enjoy my sandwich before it melts. To be a worldwide smash hit. The first one Marvel Studios has had in years. Now, you would think that any sane film studio who is also a comic book publisher, like Disney is with Marvel, would capitalize on the success of a movie with such deep cuts by converting as much as possible of its audience into comic book readers. But alas, Disney, as much as possible of its audience, into comic book readers. But alas, Disney and Marvel under Disney ownership are not sane companies. Because ensuring that anyone who attempts to check out new Deadpool deep cuts by converting as much as possible capitalize on the success of a movie with such deep cuts by converting as much as possible of its audience into comic book readers. But alas, Disney and Marvel under Disney ownership are not sane companies. Because ensuring that anyone who attempts to check out new Deadpool comics will walk out right away. They just retooled the title in adherence with the Kathleen Kennedy Doctrine. Put a kick in it, make her gay! Deadpool and Wolverine is in theaters, and the San Diego Comic Con is on. So leave it to Marvel to find a way to use one to undermine the other by making a brand new comic book announcement and sharing it with the world on X. Deadpool is dead. Long live Deadpool. Get your first look at Wade's daughter Ellie taking up the mantle in two new covers and follow her new mission in Deadpool 7 by writers Cody Siglard and Alexis Quasarano, with art by Andrea DeVito this November. So in the comics, Deadpool is functionally immortal because Thanos won't let him die, a fun concept that predates Marvel Comics losing their minds to the woke mind virus, as well as a possible prequel that you'd think the movie division Marvel Studios would be salivating at, especially after the success of this movie, and I'll have more to say about Marvel Studios in a bit here. But before we get to them, let's focus on the comic book division, Marvel Comics, that must have completely and utterly lost their minds, as they just killed off the immortal Deadpool pool and put a chick who is lame and gay in his book instead of him. Getting all your daily nutrients? Well, is I didn't know that. Work. But yep. nutrition gaps There's in your diet are daily. inevitable. Uh, uh, uh. To set up why this is so insane, let's go back a decade in time to when the MCU was on top of the world delivering banger after banger, winning over audiences of both genders across culture and language barriers, something the MCU was able to do because Ike Perlmutter's Marvel Creative Committee was still in place. It mm -hmm. ensured that all of the MCU movies Kevin Feige produced had to be toyetic, so they would appeal to kids buying toys and adult collectors alike. Each project had to be good and stand on its own, while still being interconnected to the larger whole. This was the secret formula behind the MCU success, and something Kevin Feige would scrap in favor of the MCU as soon as he had the clout to do so, which we covered extensively over the course of two videos detailing the rise and fall of the MCU, both of which are linked to in the description. But point is, even when the MCU was in its prime, Marvel Comics were struggling, because the massive audience for Marvel on the big screen just weren't converting into comic book readers. Why they weren't was a mystery to Marvel Comics, though it should have been blatantly obvious to anyone with their mental fact. Hmm. faculties in somewhat working order. You see, this was the time when Marvel Comics were implementing the precursor to the MCU in the comics, the all-new, all-different initiative, where Marvel Comics went full woke, replacing the bulk of their heroes with female and or more diverse counterparts. Meaning, if any movie-going audiences just coming out of, say, Avengers Age of Ultron decided to check out the comics, 
as they couldn't wait for the next movie featuring their favorite heroes. They'd give up right away, because their favorite characters weren't in them. If they picked up a Thor comic, because their favorite characters hmm. weren't in them. If they picked up a Thor comic, they wouldn't find the Thor they knew from the big screen. No, they'd find Lady Thor. If they picked up a Hulk comic, they wouldn't find the trials and tribulations of Bruce Banner. No, they'd find some Asian kid who was Hulk at the time. If they picked up a Captain America comic, they wouldn't find Steve Rogers, but Black Falcon Captain America. Before long, if they picked up an Iron Man comic, they wouldn't find Tony Stark, but a black chick in Ironheart. This is how, at the same time as Marvel ruled the world on the big screen, Marvel Comics were verging on bankruptcy as their shitty line of comics drew away every last one of the numerous moviegoers that wanted to check those comics out. The irony here, of course, is that the official reason why Marvel Comics did this insanity in the first place was to expand the readership into new groups that would suddenly feel safe and represented by seeing themselves on the page. Obviously, it did not work, as no new readership came in. On the contrary, it was a complete disaster, as their built-in readers abandoned them in droves, contributing to many a comic book retailer going out of business in the process. Marvel Comics eventually had to revert to the traditional heroes, just to stay afloat. But by the time they did, Kevin Feige had wrestled control over the MCU away from Ike Perlmutter, and caused it to go full woke as well, at which point moviegoers were no longer interested in checking out the comics. Why would they be when they were rapidly losing interest in even the movies? As it turned out, what failed in the comics failed in the movies as well. You would think that someone in Marvel Comics would have learned some lessons from this whole disaster, but nope, the woke mind virus is nothing if not resilient. So here they are, repeating what has never worked before, by effectively gender-bending Deadpool, thereby squandering the best opportunity to convert moviegoers into comic book readers that they are likely to ever have. And depending on how things play out, this may even be their last chance to convert moviegoers into comic book readers. Because leaving Marvel Comics aside and going back to the movies, you'd also hope that the success of Deadpool and Wolverine would inspire some level of soul-searching in Kevin Feige and his merry band of woke yes-men surrounding him in Marvel Studios, and hope springs eternal, I guess. But my fear is that the woke mind virus is too resilient even in Marvel Studios. You see, Kevin Feige never wanted to do another Deadpool, and he certainly never wanted to bring back Hugh Jackman. Hell, he even tried talking Jackman out of it. Mm. By all accounts, the movie only happened because Ryan Reynolds petitioned Bob Chapek directly, and Chapek gave it the green light, with the R rating, swearing, gore, and everything. But Chapek is gone now. It's Bob Iger and Kevin Feige, the architects behind the MCU's destruction, that will determine what lessons to take away from this unexpected success. Will they draw the correct conclusion or continue the failed DEI-driven MCU experiment that they brought about in the first place. I would love to be wrong here, but until otherwise is proven, I fear Deadpool and Wolverine will be just like Season 3 of Star Trek Picard. That is, a momentary respite from a string of garbage, as events conspired to let an actual creative team take charge of this one project. Only for the powers that be behind all that other garbage ignore any lessons and carry on as before. What do you think? Let me know in the comments. Um, yeah, I can't believe it. I can't believe it either that that's happening. Uh, well... So then, that is some deep shit. Um, I'm running a little on food again. I gotta try not to eat everything. Uh.
Is the door to Iron Man totally closed? Because I don't believe it is. Let me ask you the question. If I picked the jersey back up and put it on, wouldn't you feel a little bit like, oh, no. crap? No. Oh. Here's, here's what I think. Right. They go through a few semi-lackluster <laughs> Avengers movies without you. You ready for this? I'm ready. Here's the scene. There's a moment where the world's fate is at stake, and they realize they need a super genius. And then they figure out how to restart that time machine. Great. Come on. Is that you? The, the way people would freak out if you came back. Mm. Come on. Com. Greetings, you over 1 million Hellions and the 40% who haven't subscribed yet after Deadpool and Wolverine's Monster Weekend, which puts it on a trajectory to be the first movie produced by Disney Marvel to hit a billion dollars since Endgame. This predictably has everyone asking, is the MCU back? Hmm. Those fake ads really drive you mad, huh? The game looks so fun in the ads, but when you download it, it's a totally different game. That's crazy, right? <clears throat> but today... I finally found a game that's exactly the same as it's shown in the ads. <laughs> Let's, for now, answer that question with another question. Did Captain Marvel kill the MCU? No. It was just the writing on the wall. It was everything that followed. Oh, God. WandaVision, Falcon and the Winter Soldier, Loki, Black Widow, Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings. The Eternals, Hawkeye, were all a collective of diverse and inclusive failures. This losing streak was only broken up with Sony and Disney Marvel's release of Spider-Man No Way Home on December 17th of 2021. It's been a very tough time for cinemas during the pandemic, with some chains being forced to close. But one film to have broken the mold is Marvel's Spider-Man No Way Home. After surpassing $1 billion globally, it has become the highest grossing film of 2020. 21. What do you think its appeal is? Is it just at this point in time we're desperate for a superhero to come and save the world? <laughs> there may be something about that, yes, and the fact that people want to have a bit of escapism. After that much needed W, Disney Marvel decided to grab defeat out of the jaws of victory and follow that monster release with Moon Knight and Doctor Strange Mom. Miss Marvel, Thor Love and Thunder, She-Hulk, Attorney at Law, and the Black Panther sequel without Black Panther, Wakanda Forever. That is one big pile of shit. And with all of that, a lot of astute fans knew what the powers that be that the MCU didn't. Things were about to get worse with Phase 5. Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantum Media was a massive flop. Then Disney Marvel finally got a win all on their own when James Gunn returned to do Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3 right before he f***ed off to work for the competition. And Disney Marvel got right back to work squandering that success with the release of Secret Invasion, Loki Season 2, and the biggest flop in the MCU's history, The Marvels. And that's another thing that we're quite excited for audiences to finally meet the Fleur Kittens. What the f***? And to prove Kevin Feige and his crew completely went off the reservation, they decided to follow that up with Echo. I can hear you! But despite all that, there was still a glimmer of hope due to an announcement brought on by the sea of garbage I had just recited to you. Hugh Jackman was coming back as Wolverine and he was going to team up with Ryan Reynolds Let's in a Deadpool like 3. And it set the internet on fire. Hey, Pub. You're in a movie theater, not the off room in your mom's nursing home. All the trailers were well received. The marketing has been perfect and the release date has now passed. So has the MCU been saved? That question will be answered in the spoiler section. The most important question is, is this the win Disney Marvel so desperately needs? Yes, kind of. So let's talk about the movie that quite frankly, we should have gotten a long time ago, Deadpool and Wolverine. And let's not bury the lead here, considering the slop we've gotten over the last few years. It boggles the mind that it took this long and it was this hard to get Ryan Reynolds and Hugh Jackman together playing the titular characters. That's almost as bad as them taking 24 years to put Wolverine in his proper costume. You actually go outside in these things? What would you prefer? Yellow spandex? Yes. Uh, yeah. When we first started this in 1999, there was like, oh, we can't have... Technicolor. And so everyone was in black leather, basically. And, and some part of my brain, I think, was a little institutionalized that, oh, that's the way it is. And then, crazy watching the Marvel movie. You know, back, you know, they had issues like community calorie. By the time 1990s came, you had no technicolor. Not when you stand it. 
like to do you want to do the whole more thing? Like, for example, Mad Max, which was originally supposed to be, like, what? But he had no choice but to put it in the color because it was not changed. But he went back and did the work, took and made it black. And white. Yeah, made it me. I think was a little institutionalized that, that oh that's the way it is and then crazy mm -hmm. some oh we can't have technicolor and so everyone was in black leather that's funny. yellow spandex yes uh, yeah when we first started this in 1999 there was like oh we can't have technicolor and so everyone was in black leather basically and mm. in some part of my brain i think was a little institutionalized that, that mm. oh that's the way it is and then crazy mm -hmm. watching the marvel movies I'm like oh yeah this actually looks really cool that looks great and as soon as I put it on, I can't believe I never had it on before. Directly following the events of Deadpool 2's mid credits scene, Wade Wilson uses Cable's time-traveling device to go from Earth-10005 to Earth-616, which is now designated as the Sacred Timeline, which was actually the timeline for Marvel Comics, where the MCU's timeline was formerly known as 199999. Now, considering Disney Marvel Comics is a thousand times more screwed up than the MCU, at this point, I don't think it matters. Anyway, Wade does this to meet with Happy Hogan because he wants to join the Avengers where he is rejected. Six years later, Wilson is retired from being Deadpool, he's become a car salesman, he's broken up with Vanessa, and Dopinder has lost his accent. During his birthday party, the TVA, or the Time Variance Authority, for those of you who didn't watch Loki Season 1 and 2, which was a lot of you, abducts Wilson and brings him to a Mr. Paradox who offers him a place on Earth-616 due to the fact that Wade's timeline is deteriorating. And the reason Wilson's reality is falling apart is the loss of of Logan from the film Logan, which was this timeline's anchor being. An individual that holds a particular reality together. Now, why would you hang that on a mortal, even one that lives as long as Logan? Don't know, but it certainly creates a lot of questions that we'll try to answer some of in the spoiler section. Is it a commentary on the MCU with its anchor being dying, Tony Stark, and that universe going to shit? I'd like to think so. Anywho, instead of joining the TVA, Wade steals a temp bad. Yes, yeah, it's, it's a kind of a um, a studio making fun of itself because now that the Hugh Jackman of the Fox universe, I'm sorry, the, the now that the Logan Wolverine of the Fox universe is dead, the Fox universe movies, Marvel movies, would go to shit. And Deadpool is actually the one one of the one of the few Marvel, the, perhaps the only Marvel movie uh, that's made by Fox besides X Men. Well, actually, no. It's not going to shit. All the X-Men films after Logan went to shit. After the character Logan died. All of Fox, a.k.a. Oath 1001. That's 10,001. Uh, and just like when Iron Man died in, uh, oh, you know, um, Oath 616, pretty much all of MCU or MCU in Oath 616, all those movies have been shit, so, uh, don't even get me started with what, what universe Madam Web is from, I, I want to say she's from Fox, but I don't know, because Madam Web did have that kind of Tobey Maguire, Fox Studio, no, Sony, Sony feeling, but it, it's a little different, I think, um, so, I, I don't know what universe Sony is from and travels the multiverse to find a Wolverine to replace the one they lost. And the cameo-filled hijinks ensue. Again, Deadpool and Wolverine is having a monster weekend and it is immensely popular with a lot of people. For me, I liked it, but it's a bit of a mixed bag. A film carried completely on the backs of Ryan Reynolds and Hugh Jackman, who are both mm -hmm. perfect for their roles and both have brilliant chemistry, which again makes you think, why in the hell haven't they done this sooner? As with all Deadpool movies, it's self-aware and and a first for the MCU, it's self-deprecating, which is refreshing. I appreciate the love they showed towards the comic book fans. I just wish it had a little more meaning. Most of the jokes land, some don't. A lot of the cameos are great, some are okay, and there's one I didn't ever need to see again. 
Overall, it's fun but flawed and a testament to how much good characters can cover up for a mess of a story. And that's what keeps Deadpool and Wolverine from being the home run I thought it would be as far as the story is concerned, because once you start thinking about it even a little bit, it starts falling apart. It's both a bit bloated and slow, and while being cynical and meta certainly works for Deadpool, it's only because there's a sprinkle of earnestness and heart, something the previous two films had, and this one doesn't have so much. Much. That's why it's the third best Deadpool film, which is light years better than anything Disney Marvel has cranked out in the last few years with maybe arguably the exception of Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3. But enough of the vagary, let's get to the spoilers. Now, a lot of people were worried, including Hugh Jackman and Kevin Feige, that bringing Wolverine back would ruin his send-off in Logan, but I like their solution. The film opens up with Deadpool digging up the corpse of Wolverine and using his bones to murder TVA agents during the credits, and it was brilliant. The only disappointing part were the credits were normal. From the first trailer, I had my concerns about the TVA. My hope was it would be a Fox version used to completely destroy it, and in the beginning, it looked that way. Of course, you haven't watched Loki, so you wouldn't know that Kang used to prune universes and then they stopped doing that in season two. So Mr. Paradox invents a magical bullshit machine called a time eater that essentially does that. And I thought, hey, that could fix a lot of problems. Instead, it turns out to be a MacGuffin. How do I know this? In the film, they call it a MacGuffin. This is why Deadpool steals the temp pad because he's got 72 hours to save his universe. And when he starts searching for Wolverines, it's absolutely brilliant. We get the cover of Uncanny X-Men 251. We get Age of Apocalypse Wolverine, Patch, comic book accurate Wolverine, which was hilarious. John Burns Wolverine in the brown costume, book accurate Wolverine. 51. We get Age of Apocalypse Wolverine, Patch, comic book accurate Wolverine, which was hilarious. John Burns Wolverine in the brown costume, about to fight the Hulk and Henry hilarious. John Burns Wolverine in the brown costume, about to fight the Hulk and Henry Cavill as Wolverine or Cavalrine. There's also a comic book accurate Old Man Logan, and I hope Mark Miller, who I will continue to call Mark Millar, gets his residuals from this film. Eventually, Deadpool finds his Logan and just so happens to be the worst Wolverine that ever existed. In a brief but well-acted exposition scene, we find out Logan was out drinking and the humans came and killed all the X-Men and in turn, Logan went on a killing spree that turned humanity against mutants. And then Mr. Paradox prunes both Deadpool and the worst Wolverine and they are sent to the void where we spend the vast majority of this film. What's the void, you ask, because you haven't seen Loki season one and two? Well, when Kang mattered, it's where variants were pruned to go and basically die. The void is essentially ruled by Charles Xavier's twin sister, Cassandra Nova, who was pruned at a very early age because she was so scary powerful, which sounds similar to what happened to female Loki in the Loki series you didn't watch. Her base of operations is the corpse of Ant-Man as Giant Man, and she has a deal with the TVA to do what the hell she wants in the void as long as she doesn't come back to the sacred timeline. And I have to admit, Emma Corrin did a pretty good job with this character. This brings us to all the cameos, starting with Chris Evans. And this is one we were expecting. I love the fake out. We think it's Captain America, but it turns into the Human Torch. And it worked. Or did it? He uses his powers against the one character he shouldn't, Pyro, played by Aaron Stanford from 12 Monkeys. Then he gets skinned alive by Cassandra Nova. I actually thought my husband lost 10 pounds until I discovered his little secret. No matter how much my husband works out, he just struggles to lose his dad bod. Then he got these shirts from True Classic. They're designed to be tighter in the arms and the chest, but have a little room in the belly to hide his dad bod. These shirts are buttery soft, super Leading some to ask, isn't that just like what happened to Mr. Fantastic and Doctor Strange Mom? I would say Doctor Strange Mom wasn't supposed to be a parody and Deadpool and Wolverine is. There were a lot of returning X-Men. Mom, like what happened to Mr. Fantastic and Doctor Strange Mom? You mean Wanda Maximoff, a.k.a. Scarlet Witch? I would say Doctor Strange Mom wasn't... Oh, he's talking about Multiverse of Madness. M-O-M. -M, get it? It's supposed to be a parody and Deadpool and Wolverine is. There were... I would say Doctor Strange Mom wasn't supposed to be a parody and Deadpool and Wolverine is.
is there were a lot of returning Doctor Strange Mom wasn't supposed to be a parody and Deadpool and Wolverine is there were a lot of returning X-Men mostly in the background and some of them were actually played by the act there were a lot of returning X-Men mostly in the background and some of them were actually played by the actors who originally played them in the films, like Ray Park as Toad and Tyler Maine as Sabretooth. By the way, that big fight ended up being a Furiosa gag, which we'll get to in just a moment. I'm the Juggernaut, bitch! But then characters like the Juggernaut from X-Men 3 wasn't. Where the hell was Vinnie Jones? By the way, he was great in The Gentleman. I just got asked to do Deadpool, the new one that's coming out now, and I spoke to the director and I just said, it's such a drama putting that suit on. You know, mentally and physically. I mean, it, it, it had its mental toll. We couldn't strike the deal for Deadpool. You can let me out of here. I need a pee. But the big ones were Daphne Keene as X-23, Jennifer Garner as Elektra, Channing Tatum as Gambit, which was fun to see, but now I completely understand why they never made a movie with them, and it proves that Taylor Kitsch was a better Remy LeBeau. But the one that had me hollering and applauding like the unapologetic nerd that I am was Wesley Snipes returning as Blade. He was brilliant, he could still play the part right now, and as he stated in the film, he's the only Blade. There's also multiple Deadpools, including but not limited to Dogpool, Ladypool, played by Blake Lively, Matthew McConaughey as Cowboy Pool, and Nathan Fillion as Headpool. Now this is no Spider-Man No Way Home, some of the cameos work, but not as well as that film. And it was held down by the whole Disney Marvel of it, including the heavy involvement of the TVA, and when you had a pretty good villain like Cassandra Nova in a position to completely wipe it out and you don't do it is one of your biggest mistakes. And then bringing in body positivity time cop girl boss from Loki to clean everything up was just cringe. Just a quick reminder that Kang determined everything that happened in the MCU because no one had free will up to Loki season one, and this is a constant reminder of it. Yes, there were a lot of jokes aimed at Marvel, including... Welcome to the MCU, by the way. You're joining at a bit of a low point. Can we just be done? Oh, we're just getting started. No, 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 with the whole multiverse thing. It's not great. It's just been miss after miss after miss. Which is great, but instead of getting rid of it, which Marvel should, they lean into it more. For example, right on the heels of Hugh Jackman returning to the role of Wolverine, it was just announced at Comic-Con that Robert Downey Jr. is returning to play Doctor Doom. Yeah! It was certainly mostly well-received and broke the internet, but what does this do for longevity? This led to someone on Twitter pointing out that both Tony Stark and Logan's death are now meaningless. And our good friend Quarter Black Garrett responded, this is true, but that is how comic books go. As the film points out, you don't kill off anchor characters. You can't pass the mantle. Don't reboot, recast accurately. Speaking of which, as far as Deadpool and Wolverine is concerned, you don't kill off anchor pointing out that both Tony Stark and Logan's death are now meaningless. And our good friend Quarter Black Garrett responded, this is true, but that is how comic books go. As the film points out, you don't kill off anchor characters. You can't pass the mantle. Don't reboot. Recast. Accurately. Speaking of which, as far as Deadpool and Wolverine is concerned, if an anchor character dies of natural causes, does their universe die off too? Anyway, I did overall enjoy Deadpool and Wolverine. It is meant to be watched in a packed, enthusiastic theater. A fun movie with the message of meaning and redemption that gets mostly lost in the gobbledygook of a paper-thin story and a lot of cameos. In a movie that felt rushed, maybe one of the six screenwriters should have taken another pass and maybe they should have taken another year and they would have gotten the home run they were hoping for. Instead, it's just a win, which they need. Unfortunately, they're following with Agatha all along, which didn't get a mention at the Hall H panel at Comic-Con. And after that, we get Captain African American and the Thunderbolts. And I saw trailers for those at Comic-Con and they both look awful. And it's two years until we see the Russo brothers return with two Avengers films, Avengers Doomsday and Avengers Secret Wars. Add the return of Hugh Jackman and Robert Downey Jr. And that is Disney Marvel both being completely desperate and admitting failure. Now in Deadpool and Wolverine, there's Marvel Book Secret Brothers return with two turn of Hugh Jackman and Robert Downey Jr. And that is Disney Marvel both being completely desperate and admitting failure. Robert Downey Jr.'s Doomsday and Avengers Secret Die. Wars. Add the return of Hugh Jackman and Robert Downey Jr. And that is Disney Marvel both being completely desperate and admitting failure. Now in Deadpool and Wolverine, there's a Furiosa gag. Behold the head of your precious queen. 
Furiosa! Which I think Tinseltown can learn a lesson from. Furiosa was a good movie that flopped. Deadpool and Wolverine is a pretty good movie that's gonna be the biggest hit of the year. What's the difference? You crack the code, Kevin Feige. You put immensely popular actors who embody their characters in their proper comic book costumes and everybody showed up. And the one thing Deadpool and Wolverine does prove is Hollywood is stupid. If you like what you heard, please like, share, and subscribe. If you didn't like what you heard, I thank you for listening this long. I will see you in the next video. Subscribe. If you didn't like, does prove is Hollywood is stupid. If you like what you heard, please like, share, and subscribe. If you didn't like what you heard, I thank you for listening this long. I will see you in the next video. Nerdverotic.com. Please subscribe. Well, everybody, some people are saying that it flopped, you know? Well, not flopped, but uh, that it's not as good as, uh, you know, it's not as, it's apparently it's not as good as, uh, some people Some people think it's great, some people think it's, uh, you know, it's those issues with it involving the whole cam, all the cameos, all the cameos, all the, the, the jokes that they're trying to be funny, but maybe they're trying too hard to be funny, and, um, you know, they're, they're right about it, you know. It is the best movie, if anything, to make fun out of all the attempts they've done so far if, of making all these movies movies and stuff, you know. But to hear that the comic books had gone the same route as the, well, the comic books were going there first with the whole woke thing, uh, and then the movies followed suit, it's like, it's got to stop at some point, I think, you know. Uh, I still haven't read much about the D uh, Doctor Doom being played by Robert Downey Jr. Uh, I plan on covering that in my next set of videos as I watch more reviews on that, you know. But let's continue with Deadpool, so. I recently watched and reviewed Deadpool and Wolverine stating I really enjoyed the film. I recently watched and reviewed Deadpool and Wolverine stating I really enjoyed the film even though it had a myriad of problems in the story department. So today I want to talk about those the cameos, all the things that worked really well, some of the things that annoyed me, and why the film doesn't really care, because at the end of the day, it proclaimed it was a paradox with one of the main villains, thereby giving it a get out of jail free card. If you haven't seen the movie and you want to avoid spoilers, obviously don't watch this. Otherwise, let's jump in. Speaking of spoilers, I'm going to be doing another video on how freaking annoyed I am with studios, with actors, with other publications, posting spoilers for movies before they're even out sometimes, before the film is even in theaters. It annoys the living hell out of me, and I'm going to be doing a rant on that coming up. So if you like movie reviews, movie rants, all things movies all the time, feel free to subscribe to the channel, like the video. Let's begin. I gotta put this out right away. I saw this movie one time. I'm not like a hardcore nerd trying to use my own headcanon to explain away all the weird inconsistencies in this film. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I love the Deadpool movies. I'm a huge fan of 20th Century Fox, superhero flicks, all the X-Men movies. Some of the X-Men movies I really like. <laughs> I like most of the characters, though, from those early ones. I thought Hugh Jackman was great. I thought even Scott... Even Michael Marsden as Scott Summers, a.k.a. Cyclops. I was okay with him and how poorly they wrote that character. I'm still fine with it. I'm one of those guys. So for Deadpool and Wolverine, I went in with very high expectations because I knew Jackman was coming back. I love Ryan Reynolds. I thought the idea of a buddy road trip film was great. It seems to be so in line with the character. Having that serious, angsty, angry character with Logan bouncing off with the smart ass Merc with the mouth, that's, <laughs> that's, that's instant gold. And in that yeah. aspect, this movie freaking nails it from top to bottom. I thought almost every joke worked for me. I was laughing my ass off, the theater was loving it, my kids mm. really liked it, but there is a lot of stuff that's gonna fly over the heads of people that aren't quite as nerdy as maybe you and I are. Let's break it down. The film starts establishing that Wade is really happy with some aspects of his life, mainly 
his friends. Really his family at the end of the day. It's all he has. He's blowing out the candles. He has a birthday to celebrate. And it's also established kind of oddly that he is no longer with Vanessa. They split up. I, I don't know why this was something they had to write into this story. It didn't really seem to add anything to this character and it felt like such an afterthought to throw in. Like maybe there's much more going on here behind the scenes. This was maybe a larger arc that they just didn't go with. Because the first two movies are very much about these two. The first one's a love story. The second one's about getting her back somehow. Mm -hmm. it's, it's all about family. And so then to, to have it kind of feel undercut in this one by saying, oh my God, this guy freaking turned back time literally to save her ass. To not have them together in this felt a little bizarre. That, that, that's all. Just a little side hang up I had. I, I don't get why they did it. Anyway, the... Yeah, that's what I don't understand is why they messed that up because that was literally the first thing that Deadpool did. What well, uh, uh, you know, uh, Wade Wilson as soon as as soon as uh uh the 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 nuke girl whoever her name is fixed his cable uh cables uh time traveling device that was a watch immediately uh, Deadpool he goes into a he he goes to save Vanessa. He goes to wreck that one wrong that was the premise of Deadpool 2 because in the beginning of Deadpool 2 he's steadily trying to kill himself because he failed to save his girlfriend and with the time time uh, traveling device he's able to wreck the, that one wrong immediately and right after that he goes into fixing the wrongs involving X-Men Origins Wolverine with this aspect of him Deadpool killing him off before Logan has to fight him, which I still don't get because if Logan cut his head off or whatever, well, maybe he wasn't invincible to the head, but uh, anyway, yeah, then he, you know, went on to correct uh, Ryan Reynolds' own uh, signing of the Green Lantern script and the uh, Hitler thing, and you can, we, we can watch on YouTube, but anyway, why did they write, you know, Vanessa to break up with him? Because it didn't even give us a reason why, other than the fact that he never got back up, he, uh, he never tried to do anything meaningful that was bigger than himself, uh, I guess because... The only bigger than himself that he did in the first two movies was in the first movie he saves Vanessa's life, and in the second one he does it. Because the first one he does save her life, but then when she's his girl, he sees his girlfriend, he, he can't save her life, and that and she's she's pretty much uh, an anchor for him in both movies, and in this one she's not. It's just about him mattering, and so it didn't have a heavy enough story, you know. And so, um, yeah, I feel like she was just put in there. Literally as a uh, as an extra, as a uh, not even as a cameo, but as an extra. The TVA shows up, interferes with his birthday celebration, show for celebration, and they kidnap his ass. And this is all done at the request of Mr. Paradox, played by that dude from Succession. Fantastic show, by the way. And here is where things already are completely off the rails and lose me. Now, I, I came yeah. out of the theater saying, I love the movie, it's really funny, uh, you're gonna have a good time if you shut your brain off. And some people push back, were like, how dare you question this brilliant plot? It makes perfect sense from top to bottom. Well, maybe you can clarify uh, a couple questions I have. We're gonna, we're gonna jump into it right now before I get into all the fun things that I loved. Because there's a lot of exposition going to take place in a second when he talks mm -hmm. to Mr. Pool and explains to Deadpool that, hey, Wade, your world that you love, it's dying. It's going bye bye. And I don't have the time, which is ironic because Mr. Paradox has all the time in the world working for the TVA mm -hmm. to wait around for it to slowly eat itself and fade away from existing altogether because this timeline is shot, dude. It's cooked. Mm -hmm. So he has developed a time ripper. Well, I guess he he's brought it back. They they outlawed him. It's in the corner. It's in like a warehouse somewhere. They dusted it off. They fired it back up. And they're going to just shred through timelines that they deem ill-fit to survive any longer. Mm. But he's for the TVA. The mm. TVA has a... We've established through Loki, at least the first season that I watched. I didn't watch season two. That time for the TVA is irrelevant. It doesn't work the same as it does for us mere mortals. So why does he need to speed the process up? I don't know. But that's just a small little tiny question I have about this movie. But I do want to also say, before you get upset and go, Adam, you're missing the, the point. 
Well, I think the point is they've given themselves an out. His name is Mr. Paradox, which already tells the audience, hey, we're going to say a bunch of stuff and it actually doesn't make any sense. And that's the genius of it all. We can do whatever we want with no consequence. Nothing needs to make sense. It's a Deadpool movie. That's fine. But then don't waste so much time explaining things that are meaningless and don't add up at all. So we have a, a world Deadpool lives in. I think it's like 10005. His world is going to be destroyed. 10001. Because the anchor person is dead. The anchor person being Logan. This concept to me is really weird. There, there's one dude or one female or male or whoever that's the anchor to an entire universe. Not just the planet Earth, the entire universe is hinging on one individual, that's nonsense. That's shenanigans. And also, this person's not around forever. Logan's been alive for a couple hundred years. How is it sustaining before then? It's not really a butterfly effect when your butterfly is not even alive. So the idea on its face is ludicrous, but then it gets even more confusing. Because Logan's not actually dead yet in Wade's universe. That doesn't happen until 20... 29 or something. It's in the future. I know that. It's in the future. Also weird is the idea that these two worlds... That is why it's in the future. That's... I didn't think about that. That's actually in the future. The whole Logan is not even in 20... Let me look this up. Yeah, 2029. Hmm. That is interesting. Worlds are the same because how depressing is it that in a few years Wade's entire, you know, Earth is going to be a shit show. It's basically post-apocalyptic. Most of the mutants are dead because Professor Xavier had a bad headache in Logan. And so that's what we're saving it for. That's what X-23 is growing up in. These people are all going to be shit out of luck even if they do bring Wolverine back. Unless he can change the course of things. In which case, why does the TVA send Wade to the point in time where Logan is already dead and gone for many, many years? His body is completely decomposed and all that's left is the adamantium skeleton. I truly don't. In time where Logan is already dead and... In which case, why does the TVA send Wade to the point... The TVA does not see send Wade. He steals the time... Uh, what was it called? Firefox phone. In time where Logan is already dead and gone for many, many years, his body is completely decomposed and all that's left is the adamantium skeleton. I truly don't know, but it did make for a really kick-ass opening sequence. That fight was phenomenal. I love that stuff. Just very playful, very silly, very cool stylized action. And that's going to be throughout the movie. Lots of kick-ass action. Now, I can't remember chronologically how this went, but at some point we also get Wade in a different universe altogether. Now, this scene's not necessarily a plot hole. I just thought it was poorly implemented in the movie. It just kind of comes out of nowhere. Deadpool is now on Earth 616 applying for a job in a you know what? I think I think the okay. So the void is where the prune is. What happens if when you're prune and you go to the void? The void is that place standing at the end of time and space. And it doesn't matter what port, what what point in time in from in which you're prune. So X X twenty three is obviously like maybe seven to ten years older than she was in Logan. In the year 2029, but she could have she could have been pruned in the year 
uh, roughly 2035 or 37 and ended up in the void, void well as Blade, we don't know which which universe he's, he's from, which Earth he's from. Um, could have been pruned any time, you know. I think I think Blade was a fox. I think Blade might have been a fox property. Uh, Blade. I'm not quite sure if it was produced by Fox or not. Let's... Let's talk about the movie. But what I'm saying is, is that when they're pruned, it can be from literally any timeline. And so, it doesn't matter where they're pruned from, you know, it really does it. So, I'm trying to find, uh... Hmm. So, so, anyway, prone to, yeah, so it doesn't matter where they're prone, and so, Logan could have went in the future to find that, uh, Wolverine to see, in that case, he should have just went back to the past and, and saved his life, you know, instead of going to the future, why didn't he go back to the past when he was, when Logan was fighting, and he could have got, he could have been prevented from, you know, uh, being peeled, pinned, pinned, pinned to the tree. Anyway, So I, uh,
Oh, we don't just say that, that. Let's continue with that. Avenger. It's, a, it's assumed that he used the time turner from Harry Potter that he got from Cable in Deadpool 2. And he went to this other multi-dimensional world where Avengers take place. And he wants to join. He went, he used the time on six, applying for a job as an Avenger. It's, a, it's assumed that he used the time turner from Harry Potter that he got from Cable in Deadpool 2. And he went to this other multi-dimensional world where Avengers take place. And he wants to join them. Then he hopped back to his world. Five years later, this all takes place for his birthday. If you're confused, his multi-dimensional world where Avengers take place. And he wants to join them. Then he hopped back to his world. Five years later, this all takes place for his birthday. If you're confused, so am I. I went cross-eyed just talking about this. And then, apparently, off-camera, he destroyed the Time Turner. No longer can use it again. So he saved a couple friends' lives, killed off a couple Deadpool that he was embarrassed by, and there we are. Scene's incredibly funny with Happy. I just don't like how confusingly implemented into the film it was. And I found the next plot line, which is the largest one, to be the biggest stretch of them all. He breaks the TVA guy's nose. He's gonna go then steal a Logan from another universe, bring him to his in order to restore the balance having that anchor character with. We have a freaking hilarious montage where he jumps into these different places, sees different versions of Logan through the comics, through the shows, through movies. It's all done very well. We even have Henry Cavill, AKA Superman, playing Wolverine. Didn't look, uh, he didn't look the greatest to me as the character. I'm gonna, I'm gonna say that. I didn't really dig the look, but it was very funny seeing him in the film. I also really appreciated the short Hugh Jackman Wolverine, how he's supposed to be from the comics and whatnot. Hilariously done. Eventually, he's gonna team up with the worst Wolverine. I thought Henry Cavill was pretty good. I thought he looked pretty well. Wolverine of them all, the one that failed his timeline. We do get trickles of why he was the worst and how he let his timeline down. Eventually, we land on, okay, the X-Men were slaughtered by the humans, so he went on a rampage, killed a whole bunch of people, and a lot of innocents in the process. And so he drinks himself to death but he can't die. So it's a losing cause all around. Eventually Wade will do a good job convincing him that he can save his world as well as Wade's, which is a lie, and Logan does end up going along for the ride. But not before having a kick-ass fight against each other. This is a great scene. We get to see Logan really go into his rampage mode. He's jumping on the ground. It's, it's like a Wolverine. It's good. It's good stuff. Fighting with that 20th Century Fox logo behind them, shattered to pieces. It's, it's depressing at the same time. And this is the biggest stretch for me in the film. This is where the plot really went out the window. And I know it was established in Loki and I'm sure it's a comic booky thing. That doesn't make it any less silly. So the TVA dude, Paradox, he explains that there's a special limbo place where people can go, which is like the mi island of misfit toys or something. This whole idea is so nonsensical and really only exists so that we can show these old IP characters and celebrate nostalgia. While they're there, there's a giant beast that's going to eat their souls or something. I don't know. Cassandra Nova's. Pivot a little bit.
When you're thinking about the most ferocious animals in the world, most likely big carnivores like lions, crocodiles, wolves, and tigers come to mind first. After all, they are the apex predators, sitting on top of the food chain. But when it comes to aggression, wolverines might be gunning for the top spot. Their appearance resemble a small bear, but they're actually the largest member of weasel family. They've been called weasels on steroids, or Satan's lap dog, because although they only weigh about 35 pounds, about the size of a medium dog, but they are absolutely fearless, and will take on just about anything. They've been known to take down large-sized prey, such as full-grown moose, and caribou, which about 20 times their size. They have super-dense fur that is waterproof and frost-resistant, to adapt to the extreme northern climate. They have a great sense of smell, and they can detect carcasses, up to 20 feet under the snow. Wolverines can be found in Canada, Alaska, and smaller population in United States. When you're thinking about the most ferocious animals in the world, most likely Mm, interesting. <laughs> Mm, so much a little bit of this. Since the wolverine marks its food in various landmarks with urine and musk, a fluid secreted from the anal gland of its anus, it is known as skunk bear. And of its anus, it is known as skunk musk. A fluid secreted from marks its food and since the wolverine marks its food in various landmarks with urine and musk, a fluid secreted from the anal gland of its anus, it is known as skunk bear and glutton because of its Oh, that's why that that's that's why uh, Deadpool calls wolverine skunk bear. Voracious appetite. Wolverines are known to be the and glutton because of its voracious appetite. Wolverines are known to be the world's most vicious predators, capable of driving bears away from their kills with their sheer strength and unrelenting aggression. If you want to see some crazy wolverines in action, keep watching as we look at fearless wolverine fighting and attacking. Developed set of muscles in the neck, shoulders, and head. Climbing and digging are made possible by the long curved claws of this animal, which are semi-retractable. It has strong teeth and a well-developed set of muscles in the neck, shoulders, and head. The wolverine can survive in harsh and remote environments by feeding on frozen flesh and bone, thanks to these adaptations. According to research, wolverines kill livestock, small animals, and even moose, but no human attacks have been observed. Wolverines are powerful and aggressive, but they may be more bark than bite. Maintaining your ground during a tense confrontation may likely persuade them to flee. In our first clip, the Crockles Wildlife Park in Haines, Alaska was visited by the Haines Home School Program. The crowd received a little more than they bargained for when the wolverine appeared. The host did as well. This wolverine was extremely playful and was giving its handler a run for his money, all for the spectator's content. You can see the sharp claws on the wolverine in this video, so even when it's friendly, the wolverine is equipped with powerful weapons that can easily hurt someone. These are not animals to be messed around with, and only an expert should handle them, even if they're supposed to be tamed. Number 11. Wolverine vs. Coyotes The wolverine has tracked down the carcass of two coyotes. Tracking down the coyotes, the wolverine tries to scare them away. Coyotes, on the other hand, are wary of handing over their prey so easily and are determined to reclaim it. Nonetheless, the wolverine could easily take out both coyotes in this game. Instead of attacking the wolverine, the coyotes decide to flee. Most mustelids are smaller than wolverines. Their savagery, ferocity, and lack of fearlessness are unmatched. It is not uncommon for them to take on bears, wolves, and mountain lions. Let's get back to Adam. Sorry, Adam. Is there? She's the twin daughter of Xavier. There is so much packed into this fucking movie. <laughs> it's insane how much is in here. Really more than there needed to be. <laughs> this leads to the most brilliant cameo in the movie. One how I have no idea how I missed coming a mile away because it seems so obvious in hindsight. 
But Chris Evans is there, not as Captain America, but as Johnny Storm, AKA the Human Torch. What's odd though is Chris Evans isn't playing Johnny Storm though. He's he's almost doing a Dennis Leary style of voice. He goes on these long ranty tirades. It's really funny, but also bizarre at the same time. They're in a very Mad Max-esque post-apocalyptic setting that doesn't look near as good as Mad Max. I will say, Deadpool's never had a big budget. That's what makes these movies kind of fun. But this felt the cheapest out of the three, which is odd to think about, considering it now has Buka Bucks by Disney. Perhaps they blew the whole budget on cameos, which that, that that's to be understood, seeing as all the people that show up here. And we're gonna get to a whole bunch right now. Sabretooth from X-Men 1 is back. Toad from X-Men 1 is back. So happy, because I just re-watched both X-Men 1 and 2 with my kids before we went out to the movie. My, my, my son's 12, my daughter's 15. They both really enjoyed the X-Men movies, so they had a blast seeing these guys show up again. But let's be very Billy Crystal clear about this. A day or two's worth of nostalgia is nothing compared to a guy like myself who watched these movies back in the day. It's very fun to see these characters show up again. But at the same time, a cameo is very surface level and superficial if it's not done very well. I think about, and I mentioned this in my regular review, I, I think about Austin Powers 3. I think that's easily the weakest of all of them. The plot is incoherent, not that they have amazing plots, much like Deadpool, but Deadpool 1 and 2 actually do have pretty solid stories, especially the first one. It has some good drama. It does have some clever writing. And so I guess I expected that going into the third, foolishly so. And the same can be said for Austin Powers 3. The storyline takes a back seat to all the hijinks and all the cameos. I'm not gonna give them away if you haven't for some reason seen Austin Powers 3, but the first five minutes of that movie has like a who's who of actors show up. And it even ends that way as well. Throughout the movie, there's just tons of cameos. And like, it's fun for that one quick dopamine high, but on rewatch and further discussion, there's just nothing to that. So it's like, eh, okay, that, that was fun, but nothing lasts through that. And so here we have Wesley Snipes back as Blade, which was the biggest surprise, but also a welcome one. I freaking love Blade 1 and 2. I love that they reference Blade 3 and how Wesley Snipes doesn't like Ryan Reynolds. Deadpool makes a joke about it in the film. There are so many... Oh, I was wondering why he said you never like uh, I don't like you and you said you never did you know he didn't you know, uh um play says I don't like you and Deadpool says you know you never did I wonder what I, I was wondering what that was there's so much meta commentary throughout this movie about Disney screwing up the multiverse and how it's they suck <laughs> the new movies are terrible they talk about what they can get away with humor wise and how the overlords might not be happy with the inappropriate humor. They, they reference the failed 20th Century Fox films so many times in this. They reference real world things like Hugh Jackman's divorce. There's a knock at that. They even have a knock at Ben Affleck because Elektra was brought back into the film. Those guys were married for a long time. And so, I mean, there's just so much commentary here. You will be completely lost by a lot of these jokes I was wondering why uh, she said it's fine whenever when Ryan Winter said, I'm so sorry. Whenever Deadpool said, I'm so sorry. You, you gotta, you gotta the context of the joke in order to get it. If you're not part of the overall zeitgeist with all of these references to not only movies, but also real world stuff with these celebrities. Way early on at the birthday party, Wade ends his long speech that we don't see, it's done off camera, by stating, well, these are my thoughts on politics, religion, the environment, and everything else, and I'm not going to repeat myself again. Very good comment. It's done off camera. At the birthday party, Wade ends his long speech that we don't see, it's done off camera, by stating, well, these are my thoughts on politics, religion, the environment, and everything else, and I'm not going to repeat myself again. 
very good commentary on how Disney and other studios are like over the head hitting you with some of their ideals and whatnot. And the messaging is just so boring and stale and on the nose. So it was very funny addressing that as well. We have Gambit in this one played by Channing Tatum who never actually played Gambit. This was always a very big fan cast. I think there was a movie that was supposed to come out years ago but just failed. Instead like Taylor Kitsch or whatever his name is played him at one point in X-Men Origins Wolverine. But here we have uh yeah we have Channing Tatum, Che Tate doing a very funny Cajun accent. Uh, lots of jokes at that expense how they don't know what he's saying. He doesn't look very good, in my opinion, as Gambit. Looks a little, you know, be like me with the mask. You need a thinner physique for it, okay? You need to be a little bit thinner for the role. Jenny Tatum back in the day, maybe, but, you know, we're, we're growing up and we're not slimming down is, I guess, the reality of things. So we have Channing Tatum, we got Jennifer Gardner, we have Wesley Snipes, we have Chris Evans, and we have X-23. That character's back from Logan. She's growing up more, and apparently she's also in this limbo place. I don't fucking know why any of these people... I don't, listen, again, it doesn't make any sense. Why are these people in limbo? Why are they still alive? Why weren't they eaten by that giant creature? There's also apparently hundreds of Deadpools running around here that are mentioned. We have a really funny one, a, a peace-loving Deadpool, also played by Ryan Reynolds. And then, of course, there's Dogpool, this really disgusting-looking dog that Wade Wilson absolutely adores. And if I forget any cameos along the spoiler rant, that's to be expected because there's just so many things. And it's really disgusting. Pool, also played by Ryan Reynolds. And then of course there's Dog Pool, this really disgusting looking dog that Wade Wilson absolutely adores. And if I forget any cameos along the spoiler rant, that's to be expected because there's just so many things that happen in this film at any given moment. Let's jump to Cassandra Nova, the twin of Xavier. She hates him because he tried to kill her in utero because even baby Xavier knew that she was gonna be dangerous down the road. I mean, that's a fine beginning character arc for someone. The problem with this thing is she's been ruling this Mad Max world for a long time, and all it took was Logan to say, Charles Xavier's a good dude. He would never leave a man behind. He would never kill someone unarmed. That's not his way. And Cassandra Nova's like, oh yeah, I guess I never thought about it like that before. You guys can leave. And that just felt a little, a little too easy, in my opinion, for someone that seemed to very much hate Charles Xavier. I do want to pump the brakes for a second. Also point out that Paradox's reason for keeping Deadpool alive so that Deadpool can be an Avenger... Why? That, that's one thing I just do not get. Why does Paradox give a shit about Deadpool and having him go be an Avenger? D Paradox wants to be a God King. He wants to be the TSA. Why invite Deadpool and Logan now to go try to save his timeline? I think at some point, um, Fox was kind of getting low in the M. Well, you know, Disney owns Fox now or something. Not Fox, but, you know, it's all about how they, uh, Fox got the, they, re they regained the rights to X-Men from Disney. So, Deadpool being a uh, Fox property, um, Disney wanted Deadpool, so that's kind of like, you know, old 616 wanting Deadpool, you know. Uh, and, you know, he when he said he wanted to be TVA, that's kind of a hint that 616, I'm sorry, that it's kind of a hint that, uh, Disney wants to own all of Marvel. No matter what movie you, that, that 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 you know is out there, Fox, Sony, whatever. So that's that's what that is. And uh, ultimately, Deadpool escaping and saying he's gonna break his nose is kind of like Ryan Winter was saying "fuck you" to to Disney. Um, he originally was probably on bar, but at some point during the whole pre-production, they were probably like kind of, kind of literally saying, "Why don't we want Deadpool to be?" Disney property and Ryan was probably on game first but then he heard some things and or found out some things and he said you know what fuck it I'm not going to do that I'm uh I'm Deadpool is not going to be a part of uh uh, uh Disney it's going to say that Fox and something like that and they just made a joke about it in, in the movie and that you so desperately want to rip apart 
just kill these two idiots. That that stuff was just very, again, like, eh, nothing matters, it's paradox, whatever, sort of thing. Back to Cassandra, she really likes digging her fingers into people's faces, that got old fast. She is a cool kind of character, I mean, she has cool power, she's unstoppable pretty much. Also kind of a, just a wet sack, not much there. Not, not much to the character, wasn't really thrilled with her, but the Deadpool movies haven't had the greatest villains. Cable easily being the best for me. I almost forgot Pyro's in this too, from X-Men 2, X-Men United, and uh, X3. <clears throat> he was fine. He, he, he almost got a monologue out, but they killed him before he could. Poor bastard. I'm a little bummed no other original X-Men showed up, considering they had so many of the villains and the misfit toys from the other movies. I thought we were gonna get a really amazing flashback where Logan went off and killed a bunch of people after the X-Men died. Would have been a nice way to show Charles again and uh, Cyclops and... I don't care that much because I really love X-Men Days of Future Past. Freaking awesome movie. I thought they really did a good job putting a bow on everything, cleaning up the events of X3 and giving these people one final goodbye. So I'm not, I'm not hugely upset. It just could have been a pretty sweet cinematic scene to watch Logan go through on a rampage and uh, well, whatever, we'll put it aside. There's so, there's so much action in here and so much fan service that I, I forgive it. And speaking of fan service, let's jump ahead to the most absurd scene in the movie that comes out of nowhere. But again, these are all kind of like SNL five minute skits and I'm cool with it. They get their hands on the Doctor Strange spinny portal thing, jump back to Earth 10005, but they're quickly thwarted by Nova and like a hundred Deadpools, including Lady Deadpool, a Samurai Deadpool, and Baby Pool. Lots of stuff happening here. Amazing action sequence takes place. There's a good one shot that goes on for a while. Yeah, I dig it. I I'm a little surprised Baby Pool didn't do any fighting. I thought it would be pretty sweet to do a, a Baby Yoda kind of flipping around thing like the old prequel movie where where Yoda's flipping around like an idiot. I want to see that with Baby Pool. But, uh, you know, we, we got enough. We got enough here. Beggars can't be choosers. Also weird that Lady Pool didn't take off the mask and reveal she was Blake Lively or whoever she was. I'm pretty sure it's Blake Lively. Regardless, that stuff's great. Again, yes. it just kind of happens. Uh, Nova apparently just had them all hanging out in a cell that she was able to whip them up so fast and bring them out. And this leads us to the final confrontation where Logan and Wade have to decide who's gonna be the hero. We get ourselves an Armageddon situation. I'm surprised they didn't call out Armageddon where Wade tricks Logan, throws him out of the room, locks himself in, gives him a kiss and a wave, and he's gonna be the one that's gonna connect these two timeline threads together, <laughs> having to take the blunt force of it all, sacrificing himself so that the Time Ripper, which is going to destroy these worlds, doesn't succeed. What has happened is Nova has got her hands on the Time Ripper and she's gonna destroy all of it. Every timeline's gonna go except for one. I think. I blacked out for a while. Except for the void. That's kind of like saying somebody's gonna destroy all the Disney property and that, or, or Marvel property and that Marvel, no more Marvel movies would be made. But then Wade Wilson and, and Logan Wolverine saving Saving these universes is like saving the franchise, you know, all the movies. Well, I'm pretty sure that's what happened. We're informed that there's a way to stop this. I blacked out for a while. I'm pretty sure that's what happened. We're informed that there's a way to stop this by becoming a channel between these two, a bridge to, to sync all this together. The TVA guy explains uh, <laughs> so much exposition. <laughs> What he wasn't expecting though is for both Logan and Wade to team up hand in hand and become this unbreakable chain, forming an unbreakable bond that would seal their fates forever in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. And so they survive, they save Earth, one five. Wade is able to go back, blow out his candles, and live happily ever after with Logan by his side. It's a nice film. I had a good time with it. Can't say it was like a brilliant movie, but it was definitely one for the fans and there's tons of humor throughout. I was laughing my ass off. I was impressed with some of the great action scenes, not only with that opening number, but also that car fight with Logan and Deadpool. Amazing stuff. 
The only disappointment was that the cameos didn't really get to shine. They gave them all their little hero spots where Elektra's using her size and Blade is... I, uh, I don't know what Blade did. Blade didn't do much of shit. Why didn't Blade get some cool moments? Why didn't he have his jacket? Why wasn't he busting the katana out like crazy? There was a couple Uzi shots, but uh, yeah, I love Blade. I just wanted to see more. Che Tate actually had the coolest fight with the cards. Could have saw more of that as well. Um, overall though, yeah, this, was a, this was a fun time at the movies. I think I hit most of the cameos. I'm sure I missed one or two, and I, I, a, a thousand apologies if I did. But I'd love to hear your thoughts. Did I touch upon everything? Did it make sense how I explained it? Did I completely miss a lot? It's, it's possible. There's a lot here. Let me know in the comments. Please, again, think about subscribing, liking the video, sharing it if you want. And hopefully, I see you next time. I'm sure. wow. Every great wizard has started out as nothing more than what we are now. Students. If they can do it, why not us? Kevin Smith, have you... You gotten your Chronicon tickets yet, man? It's coming up. It's in October. It's in Chicago. The very first ever IRL in real life, as the kids used to say on the internet. Chronicon, man. Me and a host of guests from the Viewsk universe and whatnot. Uh, the merchants, vending things, uh, signings, photos, panels, script readings. It's going to be an amazing time. Chronicon from Jane Silent Bob Reboot comes to life. Chicago, October 11th, 12th, and 13th. Tickets available right now at csmod.com. Hey, kids. Me, Kevin Smith, and uh, I went to see... Deadpool and, and Wolverine, man. Um, got these popcorn buckets. I went to see it at the landmark uh, over what in the Sunset Plaza. It used to be the Lemley Sunset Five. Clerks played their uh, midnight shows on Friday and Saturday for like one year straight. Um, so now it goes up. It used to be the Lemley Sunset Five. Uh, over what in the Sunset Plaza. It used to be the Lemley Sunset Five. Clerks played their uh, midnight shows on Friday and Saturday for like one year straight. Um, so mm. now the uh, sun's up landmark uh, over what in the sunset plaza used to be the Lemley Sunset Five. Clerks played their uh, midnight shows on Friday and Saturday for like one year straight. Um, so now it was an AMC and now it's a landmark and uh, Ryan James, friend of mine works there. And so him and the manager of the joint and gave me popcorn buckets after the movie was done. Uh, me and Jen went, my wife, yesterday. I used to I used to do travel checks there. I also used to see movies there, but I used to see travel checks there. Uh, three o'clock show uh, on Thursday, first uh, show we could possibly see it. I own my own movie theater uh, in Atlantic Highlands, New Jersey, Smodcastle Cinemas, where it's playing right now and where we're doing a sold-out screening on my birthday, August 2nd. But uh, I'm here in Los Angeles, so I couldn't get back. You know, I couldn't fly just to go see. I, I paid the money and here and went and saw it locally. And, and because of that, I got this shit. Mm -hmm. um, okay. I got this shit. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Uh, what I bought, what I thought. Uh, before, well, you know what? I'll tell you. Remind me to tell you who I sat next to in the same aisle with watching the movie and met before the movie began. I'll close with that. Um, let's just lead with the important stuff. Uh, when, you know, from the moment we all saw that Deadpool footage that they, somebody leaked on the internet years ago, uh, which everyone maintains is probably Ryan Reynolds, but whatever. Um, man, oh man, have we been stoked for this, the comic book superhero that takes down other comic book superheroes, deconstructs them and has a good time with them. Um, uh, comedy, the superhero comedy, the comic book movie comedy to end all comedies. And uh, it was R rated. And Ryan Reynolds absolutely delivered in a big, bad way. And, you know, he'd always been a movie star for years, but this took him to a different level altogether. Um, it, it, Deadpool was a discovery uh, for, mm -hmm. for mainstream uh, culture. 
Um, he'd been a comic book favorite for years, thanks to Rob Liefeld. Um, but, uh, and, and then authors that came after Rob, who kind of turned him into the Merc with a mouth. But, uh, you know, Ryan Reynolds saw something in that character early, early on, got to play a version of that that came to Rob Liefeld. But it's a comedy, a comic book movie comedy to end all comedies. And uh, it was R-rated. And Ryan Reynolds absolutely delivered in a big, bad way. And, you know, he'd always been a movie star for years, but this took him to a different level altogether. Um, it, it, Deadpool was a discovery uh, for, for mainstream uh, culture. Um, he'd been a comic book favorite for years, thanks to Rob Liefeld. Um, but, uh, and, and then authors that came after Rob, who kind of turned him into the Merc with a mouth. But, uh, you know, Ryan Reynolds saw something in that character early, early on, got to play a version of that character in one of the Wolverine movies, one of the many X-Men Wolverine movies. And, uh, but didn't get to wear the costume and they sewed his mouth closed and just... He never, as my slippers, man, that wasn't me farting. Um, he was, uh, you know, of course, like, man, there's, there's got to be a better way. This character is so much cooler. And uh, financed that mini shoot uh, that demonstrated what Deadpool could be. And, and here we are. Uh, Deadpool, uh, the first one and the second one, were absolutely wonderful. Um, they, they're funny as fuck. Like, and, you know, as somebody who purports to do comedy for a living, um, you know, the, it, I doff my cap uh, uh, all the time. It, 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 Ryan Reynolds' delivery is pitch perfect combination of, of, of um, it, Chevy Chase-isms. There's, there's, a, there's a moment in the movie where, in, in the Deadpool Wolverine, where uh, he's got the dog pool and the dog pool's licking his face and he's kind of like looking him back total fucking chevy chase move um and uh you know he his timing is impeccable um and and uh the fact that he's canadian has always made it more delightful for me as a big canada fob so i loved the first two deadpool movies i had high hopes going in for this Deadpool movie. Marvel has had a tough go of it as of late with a bunch of people being like, it's over. It sucks. Um, so, you know, when Deadpool introduced himself in the trailer as Marvel Jesus, mm. once again, their finger was on the pulse. Uh, you know, they, 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 the jokes were timely as fuck as they knew that they were losing the audience and whatnot. And uh, the hope was... Oh, Birdie chiming in. The hope was that there's a little German shepherd. Um, the hope was that uh, oh my god, this movie will you know right the ship so to speak, bring people back. And and it, it took a long time after the Fox, you know, Disney's purchase of Fox, for them to figure out how they were going to incorporate an R-rated Deadpool into their plans. And but why would you ever even leave them behind? The movie made both of those movies made so much money, and they're fucking good. So, um, bam, it took a minute, but suddenly they started talking about, Hey man, this movie's going to happen. And it promised, uh, you know, the bits and pieces we heard, uh, over the last year, two years, um, that start coalescing, you know, when they start shooting, seeing Hugh Jackman come back, put on like a, the yellow suit that he never wore in the movies. And then the promises of of perhaps the first cinematic appearance of the classic cal you know everything felt right everything felt like this you know man they may be able to stick the landing here like fucking the timing is is right everything looking good and then the trailers they put out the teasers and the trailers and then you know of, of course those movies have been hilarious but they've also had a kind of earnest sincere uh, through line you know, uh, lots of laughs and, and, and some heart as well. Uh, in the previous two Deadpool movies, uh, mostly predicated on his relationship with Vanessa. And is it Vanessa? I think it's Vanessa. Um, and, uh, and uh, you know, this flick, no different. Um, but less so. 
more about like, Hey, my friends in general. Um, so there's always been like something to hold on to beyond like the, the jokes, uh, whether they're funny or, or dirty, funny or whatever the fuck. Um, and this mo- once again, it's my slipper. I swear it's my slipper. Um, this is no different. My Lord, L- lots of emotion in this. Ultimately, this is a movie kind of about, you know, forgotten heroes uh, to some degree. Um, y- y- You know, I'm a guy who's made a bunch of movies that, you know, I've made 16. The 16th movie is coming out in September. It's called The 430 Movie. And we're going to show the trailer at Comic-Con. Not like it's going to matter because we're following the Marvel panel. And who knows what the fuck they're going to show. I just saw them do a drone show online with Galactus. Uh Huh? Hmm? Hmm? It's like, uh, you can't beat them. But I will be on stage after them with for my panel, closing out Saturday night, showing the trailer for my 16th film. So in any event, I, t- I say this because I've made films that have done well, and I've made films that have not been received well at all. And, you know, it's always kind of like, oh, man, I love those movies. You love them all equally. And the ones that, you know, the audience doesn't meet you on uh, – you have to develop a weird relationship with right away. So, you know, I've referred to it as like, if you know your Bible, when they arrested Jesus, all the apostles go scatter. And they're like, what? I don't know that guy. Um, you know, when a movie flops, when you're making a movie, it's like, oh my God, this is the best. We'll always be united. And it's like going to camp and like, we'll be friends forever. Then when the movie flops, uh, people just scatter, disappear like fucking, like, uh, <laughs> you know, the apostles after Christ is arrested um and you know it takes a while for everyone to kind of poke their heads back out and be like is everything okay because nobody wants to be near a bomb when it explodes so uh in Mm -hmm. this movie you've got a few movies characters cameos from other movies uh comic book movies of your past that were doing you know the heavy lifting before the marvel cinematic universe uh came along and kind of perfected it but um you know some of those movies weren't met with the greatest box office success you know there every movie is somebody's favorite movie but like you know electra wasn't as well received as say spider-man homecoming um let's leave it at that so watching you know those movies right. pop up within this movie um in deadpool and wolverine uh and get you know what he's saying is those movies that um they didn't did they didn't do so well back in the day when they came out in box office number, but they were good movies nonetheless. So they establish what we have now as the MCU. Like what is going on now is thanks to those movies, like like Dale Devil with Ben Affleck. That it didn't receive so well in the box office; it didn't make a lot of money. But we have Dale Devil shows because of we have a Dale Devil show on Netflix because of that movie, and we have Electra because of Jennifer Gardner. We have Blade because of Wesley Snipes. They didn't do so well in the theaters, but they got a lot of fans to the point where the fans spoke up and they had to bring back the characters. And essentially, Blade was the first Marvel movie. It's what started it all. It's why they had an X Men movie and then Spider Man with Tobey Maguire, and then it all went, you know, it all soared from there kind of like a respectful final bow not redemption so to speak but like hey we remember you we see you and thank you um you held down the fort of comic book fandom and cinema until you know the big guns arrived and and you will not be forgotten and and there's a wonderful montage at the end of the movie like it gets you emotional to that you know uh green day song um, I hope you have the You know, you know, the thing about Spider Man animated series is um it was kind of the first that had all these cameos from all these other Marvel characters. So Deadpool must have got it from that, you know, in a way, because in Spider Man Animated Universe Spider up Spider Man the animated series that came out in nineteen ninety five ish on on Fox Kids, it had, you know, other characters from other comic books. Even it even included Wolverine from uh, X Men the animated series, made by the same people. The time I feel like with a bunch of behind the scenes footage, 
of the Fox films, of all the Fox, you know, uh, superhero movies, Fox Marvel films, rather, I should say. Um, so the, the movie, while being funny as fuck, and while, you know, essentially its job is to bring Deadpool into the Marvel Universe, a Disney movie, um, you know, underneath it all, underneath the hood, one of the, the beating heart of the movie is let's not forget the ones that, you know, didn't get all the love and shit like that, right, but fantastic. did the job of being a comic book movie when we didn't have as many options, when it wasn't as respected, when, you know, before Marvel came along, Marvel Cinematic Universe. Like I said, they, they, they these are the old movies like Fantastic Four, Daredevil, uh, um, Elektra, and Blade that made what it is now so i made the mcu what it is it's what made these marvel movies possible if anything the only successful franchise of that time period that had any type of good sales and good you know did did, did actually wear the box office was x-men but the standalone movies of daredevil and Electra and blade and even fantastic four which was the only other team 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 marvel movie or marvel team movie it didn't do so well compared to X-Men. So, you know, I, I'm sure you've... Uh, spoilers if you haven't seen the movie yet, obviously. Because uh, we might... We're going to get in the nitty-gritty. Um, seeing Electra show up, you know, and Jen Garner rocking a fucking wonderful Daredevil joke. Um, uh, the Seeing Wesley Snipes show up when all conventional wisdom you know based on what we'd heard about the making of the blade movie that ryan reynolds was in years ago blade three or whatever um that things did not go well seeing wesley snipe show up was like <gasps> um on so many levels not just like it's blade finally blade in a movie again but like i thought they didn't like each other that 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 ryan reynolds is a miracle maker um, so, uh, you know, seeing Marvel Jesus, um, other people, I don't want to go too deep on the spoilers, uh, but come on, who's not going to see this movie, um, mm -hmm. fast seeing people who we know very well as superheroes from another movie show up in their earlier incarnations from another iteration of comic book movie was, was absolutely fucking delightful. Um, so on that level of just like, hey man, here's a shout out for the ones that didn't do so good. I, I, I have nothing to do with these movies whatsoever, but every film you see goes through a personal filter at the end of the day, right? And like how it affects you and your life and blah, blah, blah. So it, it, while this movie has nothing to do with me, just their acknowledgement of the ones who went before that maybe weren't as successful. I gotta be honest with you, I felt a little seen as a guy who makes movies that weren't as successful and stuff. So I, I thought that was really touching. Um, but uh, hysterical. The movie's absolutely hysterical. Um, thank God Hugh Jackman came back. I know there's some people like, no, man, Logan was a perfect ending. It, it is and remains so um, because this story, while it does, you know, mm. Uh, go touch on that story. Uh, there are Wolverine in this movie isn't predicated necessarily on that Wolverine. Uh, thanks to the multiverse. Um, uh, go touch on that story. Uh, there are Wolverine in this movie. Isn't so, um, because this story, while it does, you know, uh, go touch on that story. Uh, there are Wolverine in this movie. Isn't predicated necessarily on that Wolverine. Uh, thanks to the multiverse. Um, you know, I, I watching Ryan Reynolds' dream come true in terms of like, oh my God, I'm top lining a movie with fucking Wolverine, with Hugh Jackman Wolverine, mm -hmm. um, is delightful. Mm -hmm. And it, it, all the jokes are fantastic. I mean, even the ones that just kind of thud, they're swinging for the fences each and every time. Um, and the self awareness is absolutely delightful one of my favorite like moments is there's a deadpool that uh is ryan reynolds as as they all are i would imagine and um Maybe a variant know. but he doesn't wear a mask and he looks like fucking fresh faced young ryan reynolds and uh he's like look i can 
gently touch the fourth wall too. And he turns to the camera and he goes, the proposal, <laughs> and then just turns back. <laughs> Made me laugh so fucking hard, man. The movie's absolutely fucking excellent. And I say this as a comic book fan, um, Sean uh, Levy and, and, uh, and uh, uh, you know, the writers, Rhett and Reese and Reese and Brett, and I, I can't, I've been, Zeb Wells is in there, I think, and uh, Ryan and, and Reynolds and Sean, I think those are the writing credits. Like, it was a funny movie. You know, there are know, moments in the movie where, ass, like, not just it. like, hey, man, I've been rewarded because I've been watching these movies for a long time. They did a fucking X-Men cover with Wolverine, a, a very famous X-Men cover, which was like, oh, my God. Like, you know, there's a lot of fan service in this movie, to say the absolute least. Uh, not the least of which is, of course, the moment the mask goes on. Uh, I applauded. I was the only one in my theater, but it wasn't a packed theater. It was an early show. But uh, I, w I could not, you know, I couldn't contain myself. I was like, yeah. Um, when he reaches back, it's, just, it's you know, spoilers it. in case you don't want to know when it happens if you haven't seen it yet. You've seen the shot in the trailer a zillion times when they right. slow mo walk out in front of that store, uh, the Rob Liefeld, Liefeld's feet store. The next thing that happens is he reaches back Wolverine and pulls up his cowl and puts it on. And it's, you know, I'm 53. I'm Liefeld, Liefeld's times mm -hmm. when they slow-mo walk out yeah. in front of that store, uh, the Rob Liefeld, Liefeld's feet store. The next thing that happens is he reaches back Wolverine and pulls up his cowl and puts it on. And it's, you know, I'm 53. I'm be 54 next week man Happy and birthday. you know i'm i guess yes i'm a fucking man child and mm. never really had to do anything remotely masculine or anything like that because i entered the entertainment business i'm a soft boy kid it's a total soft boy you've seen me cry on the internet for you know fucking whatever this for flash for the black panther 2 what have mm. you uh so you know I, I it's not that i take this shit seriously i just love this shit because i grew up with this shit and now as an old man mm. i get a second bite at the apple i used to read these stories and now here we are watching them play out that's why i've always loved the marvel cinematic universe man i was like oh wow it's like i get to back in 2022 i lost two very important people in my life big figures. It really wasn't until February of this year that I finally gave therapy a chance. And the cool thing here is I actually use BetterHelp to do it. In fact, I still use it weekly to this day. <laughs> and I gotta tell you, I feel very foolish for not using it sooner. I'd say it wasn't until about the fourth session, but all of a sudden I started having these just aha moments. And it was like, oh, wait a minute. So you're telling me that other people experience this and this is normal. It's helped me get my motivation back. It got me going back to the gym. It just feels like somebody took a giant weight off my shoulders. BetterHelp's mission is to make to do it all over again. And you don't really get that opportunity. You rarely get a chance to read your first comic twice. And, uh, you know, this was kind of <laughs> has been the next best thing. And plus, this just, <laughs> just appeals to me. Always has superhero stories appeal to me. I was raised a Catholic kid, so I like, you know, good versus evil and shit. But it's not so much like, yay, okay. defeat evil as much as I love comic book stories, as I've said many times and comic book movies for the same thing. Like, it's generally the story of the worst thing in the world ever happening, and everybody's wisely running from it, except for one person or, you know, a few of them, very colorfully dressed. You know, that's that to me is the root mm -hmm. of the heroic tale, the super heroic tale. Uh, so even though I'm a grown man, seeing him pull up that cow just did shit for me. You know, with the white eyes, just like Deadpool got the white eyes and whatnot. Um, so, it, it, fantastic. It, it, it's everything you hope it's going to be. It's not like, oh, it's the third time out. It's getting a little long in the tooth. Like, not at all. Um, good times to be had at Deadpool Wolverine. Hands down. Uh, I mean, this ain't going to say much, but best comic book movie of the year. Uh, there haven't been that many. That's the point. But yeah, exactly. I would there say, I would venture to say, one of the... This is the best comic book movie of the year, period. It doesn't matter where you look. This is the best. This is the best. This is this year's Across the Spider. -Man. Ten best comic book movies ever made. Easily. Um, important, too. Um, in as much as 
you know, I, I was there with somebody who's only as well versed in the stuff because of what I say, or what I'm like, Hey man, let me explain shit to you. I'm like the living embodiment of that meme of the guy who, who's yelling, yelling you know, at the girl or vice versa of like, okay, so what this means is, um, but she needed no explaining throughout the movie. Um, like at one point I explained the Wesley Snipes thing. I was like, he was in blade three and they didn't like each other. That was it. Uh, you know, they've done a good job at educating the public on all these things that used to be real inside and belong just to comic book fans. So anybody can access this fucking movie. And, um, it's an absolute fucking delight. You just smile from the top to the fucking bottom. Um, before I went in, I went to see it. The, I told you the landmark in the Lemley, what used to be the Lemley sunset five. Um, and so as I'm, uh, waiting for, we got some snacks, got like, uh, uh popcorn gin was getting some topping on it and shit. So I was standing by the side waiting for it. Mm. And an older gentleman comes up to me and goes, Kevin, uh, hello, Randall Kleiser. Now for the uninitiated, Randall Kleiser is a legendary director who, uh, shaped my childhood by directing Greece. He's the director of fucking Greece kids. And, and the Blue Lagoon and a host of other fucking movies. One of the Honey I Shrunks he had as well, or blew up, I forget which one. But Randall Kleiser, an absolute <laughs> fucking legend. And so he introduced himself as, hey man, how are you? And then uh, we wound up sitting in the same row uh, watching the movie. And at one point in the movie, um, you're the one that I want, you are the one I want, ooh, ooh, ooh. the Grease song plays. And I like lean forward and look down the aisle and I was like, Oh, uh, it was kind of delightful to see like this mm. guy who was doing it when I was a kid, man. And, and like building memories and whatnot and like Greece or right, garbage truck, um, Greece for heaven's sakes, one of the biggest movies of all time, still culturally relevant. I said to him after the movie, I was like, look at you, man, you made a movie that years later, they're still referencing it. He said, yes, in, in the scene with the best absolute cartoon violence. He was laughing all throughout the movie. He was absolutely enjoying himself, it sounded like. And you will too, kids. Who Who's not going to enjoy themselves? Deadpool Wolverine. Thanks to the folks at Landmark for giving me these. Um, they didn't have the blowjob one, but I beggars can't be choosers. Uh, <laughs> it's playing right now, Deadpool Wolverine, kids. Uh, in a theater near you, of course, uh, also playing at Smog Castle Cinemas if you want to go see it at my movie theater. Uh, there it is. Uh, there's your uh, review of Deadpool Wolverine, man. Um, fucking true delight. Get ready to feel things, kids. Not just like, ha, 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 but also, mm hmm. Uh, and that's important. Um, all right, man. Bye. Ooh. This is the cat. Greetings, everybody, and welcome to the AKA Ask Kev Anything. Every saga has a 10 year anniversary, ladies and gentlemen, and this is what happens when Jay and Sal Bob get old. I'm Kevin Smith. Cheers and blues! Smod Castle. That's interesting.
And no discount Tuesdays for him then. Let's see how much the ticket is. We're going to look at this. We're going to look at the... Check out Fandango too. Oh. Yeah, <laughs> that is funny. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Morgan Day, seven dollars. Okay. Guess check out. Eight fifty because the fee. Even got old moves out. Nine dollars for four PM. Eleven dollars at seven PM. Okay, so ten fifty. <clears throat> Probably twelve fifty. Yep, twelve fifty. So that's actually the cheapest you can find it, but then again, that's that's the uh, New Jersey, so. <sighs> the smart cat, the smart castle cinemas. The, the everyone for those who live in your, for those of you who live in uh, New Jersey. Yeah, I used to actually walk. I used to do. Uh, I used to do. Um. 
I used to do trailer checks back when it was still AMC, AMC Theaters, AMC Sunset 5, when I used to live in L.A. Uh, just about two years ago. Really about a year and a half ago. I think the last time I ever did an assignment uh, for movie major, it was a while back, I, I did uh, 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 AMC Sunset 5. I like to go by the latest ticket. They're pretty much like the, uh, they're kind of like Kabuki 8 for me. Kabuki 8 here in San Francisco is, is the non, it's, it's the only 2D, it's no premiums. And that's how Sunset 5 was. It was just a standard movie theater. No IMAX, no 40X, none of that. It was just a basic theater. And I remember I used to actually go to Wendy's and then catch the bus. After I ate the Wendy's, <laughs> after I ate the Wendy's, I'd take the bus down. <laughs> so mean, I am... Ah, ah, eighteen fifty. That's not bad. That's about the same price you're gonna get at a uh, at, at Kabuki Eight. Let's see the total in that. I'm sorry. I'm sorry to go back and forth. I'm not a store. Oh no, I'm a fun about two twenty five. Okay. Uh, I think they got Adobe. Oh, I think I know what Adobe Atmos is. That's just the sound. That's just no, that's no Dolby Theater, actually. There's no, like, Dolby sound. You know what I'm saying? Yep, see, $14. That's actually pretty good. All right, let's get involved in this. Let's get involved in this. Okay, uh, so that's that's pretty much it for, uh, I guess, episode, uh, part five, episode, uh, God, part five. Uh, we're going over almost two hours in there, so uh, I think I covered everything. Bait uh, and switch. Oh, well, there's some more I didn't cover, including film threat. So I'm going to go ahead and, I guess, end it with... Uh, We're back in third quarter planning. Adams is quarterbacking this project and. Let's F and go. That's all I can say. We're talking about Deadpool and Wolverine while Chris. Wait, wait, uh, wait. I'm not, I, 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 I took a break. I know. That's I took a quick But the video break. ended. Yeah. You just want to stand there and do nothing while you. Uh, I'll be right back. You know, Uh. Oh. Uh. Flush the toilet and come back. Look, some have criticized us for. I had to get another one. Okay, I had to get another one. For putting spoilers. Look, usually the way you talk about a film, it's whatever's in the trailer is fair game. You yep. can mention it. Um, mostly the trailers for this focused on the first act, which we discussed. We did not give away cameos. 
We didn't give away, you know, second and third act turns of the story. So it depends on what your sensitivity is for spoilers. So our original review, people were saying, there's too many spoilers. Hey, guess what? Don't watch the review until after you've seen the movie if you're really sensitive. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying don't watch the channel. I'm just saying, you know, just, you know, if you really want to remain spoiler free, maybe don't watch it until after. But we are full on. I just need to mention that when we were talking about the first act, we didn't mm-hmm. even talk about the amazing opening fight scene that's yeah, stuck even in the, the film. opening scene, we kept it like quiet, you know? So, um, and shout out to the 350 people watching on Rumble. But now it's time to get into it. Deadpool and Wolverine spoiler review. Let's effing go. Alan, tell us the story. <laughs> Alan's got two of them? And set it up in like a sentence or well technically i did it on wednesday but uh deadpool uh the his the universe is dying uh and deadpool needs to bring a wolverine back to restore uh the timeline and uh he has to go throughout the multiverse thanks to the tva fi- and he ultimately finds the worst dead uh worst wolverine in the multiverse uh, and uh, the movie is basically their adventure to save the world and save those that Wade Wilson loves. Now, that's I'll, the only thing he has left. I'll say this about the story the TVA stuff was fine, it was okay. I don't like it. Although they do kind of reference it like, hey, do you know this guy? And he says, oh, you mean Loki season one, episode five, or whatever? It's like that's one of the lines Deadpool has calling out, like, you have to know this stuff. Um, th- that's the weird thing about this film. I feel like the epic, the galaxy, the fate of this entire multiverse, <laughs> this verse, this universe is at stake. That's the overall like big story. And it's the weakest part of the movie, especially in the third act when they bring in one of the characters from Loki, this woman. <laughs> yeah. The, the crowd 15. I saw it with like cheered. B15. I was like, B fifteen. Lame. That was lame. They, they actually cheered that that no one cheered when they cheered for that character in Hall H. Yeah, in Hall H, but I didn't care. That was weak. The real story about this is redemption. Mm-hmm. Uh Wolverine's redemption, Deadpool's redemption, putting the suit back on. That's the character story. That was strong. So 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 Deadpool is reluctant to put his suit back on until a certain point while um Wolverine keeps his suit on because he never wore it whenever the X Men were alive. So it's that little uh but a little bit opposite there. <clears throat> even though he even though Deadpool did put it on when he uh got a chance to be kind of you know, as close to the Avengers as he could get. But the other stuff, you know, in the background, which got all, I felt like almost like the ending with the music, it was like, uh, it was kind of like the first Guardians movie with the dance off to save the universe or whatever. It's dumb. We know it's dumb, but we don't care because we love Mm -hmm. the characters. That's what was really strong about the film. But this overall, like, I'm going to kill this multiverse and get, take the timeline. And here's why it doesn't work, right? This is why this movie isn't, you know, a 10 out of 10, right? It's eight and a half out of 10 for me. Um, you're looking at a graphic of here's the universe. It's a line and there are branches. Yeah. And oh my God, oh, the branches are branching <laughs> off. We have to... That's not interesting. It's so I'm really telling you right off the bat, the weakest thing in the movie is that part. It's almost like looking at your phone and seeing the battery meter go down, and you're like, oh my god, I have less than 10% battery power on my phone. Right? Yeah. Battery meter go down, and you're like, oh my god. I have right. less than 10% battery power on my phone. Right? 
Yeah. That's not stakes. Stakes yeah. are represented by people and characters that you love. And looking at a graphic of branching timelines or a, a, a battery meter on your phone going mm -hmm. low isn't stakes. It's people and that you care about. And on that level, the movie did well. When, when Wolverine puts on the mask at the end, uh, people lost it. People lost it. It was insane. Like the, that was in the third act. He puts on the mask. So did he wear the mask when he was killing all those humans? Did he wear the mask then? Mask, and that he's he's in the mask. Well, there, there's a beauty to that because in the beginning, in the beginning of the second act, he's in the suit. Right. And then in the beginning of the third act, he puts the cowl on. Right. I mean, that's that's how well thought out this was. This was but played. What it proves is this is one of my point. Yeah. Character equals story. When the story is weak, which almost every standalone Marvel movie that has a villain that gets defeated at the end, the villains are kind of weak. They're weak, right? And the story you don't care about. But Tony Stark is so strong of a character, we care about him. Um, you know, Steve Rogers as Cap is so strong, you care about him. What Marvel, when, when Marvel is at their best, it's with character. What they what they are weakest mm. at is a single a villain that lasts one movie and they're gone. You know it doesn't really, and and, all, and also in the end when the characters are so strong, you end up forgiving them for that. So mm. I'm forgiving them for that part. And actually, she was a decent villain when she did that thing wrong. You end up forgiving in the end. When the characters are so strong, you end up forgiving mm. them for that. So mm -hmm. I'm forgiving them for that part. And actually, she was a decent villain when she did that thing with the fingers. The fingering. In the mm -hmm. when, they, when they everyone got fingered. Wait, I realized I could finger my bucket. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, but you're not. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. Okay. But, um, <laughs> Let me just address that because the chat is also agreeing with you. The TVA yeah, stuff was yeah. not good, that but at the same time, part. at the same time, that's what they were given. Uh, I mean, you in order to tell the story, you know, it it what it did was it took the TVA and it it threw it in the trash can and said, the, right. we're, done. "We're not going to see the TVA anymore." And I think you know it's one of those necessary evils. And you and you're right in the sense of. When you have Wade and uh, when you have Deadpool and Wolverine in the TVA destroying it, um, that that there's a level of satisfying feeling that comes from that. Even though, and because what are they going to do as an alternative to tell this story? You know, it was a necessary evil, and uh, and I thought they handled it well uh, with what they were given. Yeah, I agree. It's like if you're going to tell a multiverse story to resurrect Wolverine, mm -hmm. the worst Wolverine in the multiverse. And then give him a redemption arc that is, dude, there were there were two moments where Hugh Jackman has a moment of reflection. One with uh uh what's what's X23? Jackie, yeah. Jackie, not Jackie, but that where he's at the kind of just sitting there and reflecting. And there's there's another one, he's like just talking in the car. Like, this is where Marvel does well. There's a scene with no special effects. It's people talking, and those are the best scenes. Drama, right? Uh, and Hugh Jackman really pushed it to the limit. Like, it, it, he just, he did so good where the crowd was like, whoa, right? Like, that last trailer focused on that aspect of the film. And the, and the, uh, the, the over-the-top action that fight scene in oh. a car was yeah. so good. It gets better on second viewing. So like I said, um, the things I put, it gets action. That fight scene in oh. a car yeah. was so good. It gets better on second viewing. So like I said, um, 
The things I loved about the film were even better the second time. Mm-hmm. The things that were flaws stood out, and they're there, but they don't ruin the movie. Yeah. So I'm still uh, eight and a half out of ten for me. So you know, you can your mileage may vary. Some people is a six, is a seven. Fine, I, I I hear you, I get it, but and and the um and a couple other things that stood out. The cameos, they're not just cameos. Mm -hmm. They're characters that are integral. Okay, I'm going to ruin them now. Blade, (laughs) Wesley Snipes' Blade is so good. He's so great. It's epic. That line he has, there ain't ever going to be no no one but one Blade. Like, the, the, I... Oh, I can't wait to blade. see it again. Um, all the uh, the gambit. Reported. Oh my yeah. god, no, no, gambit was great. I mean, the reveal know. was amazing, and the then... reveal was amazing. Amazing, Channing Tatum as Blade, where he can you can barely understand yeah. him. Oh my god! Well, and, they, and they called I, out the fact I, that I it, gambit. What am I saying? Yeah, but Sorry. they called out the fact that he was supposed to have a movie, and that the movie yes. was in production, and it just never happened. Um, I'll, I'll spoil the big one. Uh, Chris Evans as uh, oh. as Johnny Storm, uh, because we kind of had an idea of is this Captain or, and it was like when when they when say the words say the words and it was perfect, um, and, and to say and to to your point about Bear that Bear. they were more than just cameos, uh, I remember my I took my daughter last night and when Chris Evans showed up, she says, uh, "Are they going to kill him right away?" Because that's what we expect and that's what we've been getting from these cameos right Um, right just someone appears and then dies i remember my i took my daughter last night and when chris evans showed up she says uh are they gonna kill him right away yeah because that's what we expect and that's what we've been getting from these cameos right Um, right just you know i thought that chris evans was gonna die immediately when he when he when all his file got sucked out by uh uh pyro when he falls down and hits his head a couple of times after his after after hitting his testicles, I thought he broke his neck and died. But no, they they saved him to be killed later by Cassandra. Just someone appears and then dies. Uh, uh, Doctor Strange, and um, and to see them actually have a role in the story and to to be able to drink them in for a while before you dispatch with them, uh, to be able. To- and to see them actually have a role in the story and to to be able to drink them in for a while before you dispatch with them uh, was, was brilliant. Uh, it was great storytelling. It was was how you handle these things right. Uh, Jennifer Gardner, you know, and, uh, and even bringing Jackie back, uh, you know, they gave they she she played an important role in the story. Yes. Yes. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, like all the cameos were substance, they had substance, right? They, there was a reason. It wasn't just, hey, you're here, let's kill you. Like they yeah. were integral. So all the cameos, you know, Blade, Channing Tatum as Gambit, um, you know, uh, Electra, and she has a great line referencing Ben Affleck that was awesome. <laughs> uh, but um, okay. yeah, let, let, okay, that mattered. It yeah. mattered. Now let me talk about the action. Um, the, the action is brilliant in this way. Um, it progresses in, in terms of intensity and in terms of how these fights take place. Um, the opening fight uh, to In Sync's "Bye Bye Bye," hmm. uh, you know that was the that was the great introduction into the film to say you're back. This is a Deadpool movie, uh, and then to finally see Wolverine be vicious and be a killer. Um, and then you have, I believe there were there were two main fights between Wolverine and Deadpool. And to have it in an open field for the first and then to have it in a car for the second just shows that, uh, you know, there's a lot of thought that has to go into these fights, which you wish Star Wars had thought about when they mm-hmm. were planning how their fights go. Um, and then the whole t- uh, mm-hmm. Deadpool core. Uh, <laughs> I mean, mm-hmm. the, uh, oh my gosh. It was funny was and it was brutal. <laughs> and by the way, by the way, confirmed, Kidpool had way more lines. Yeah, they were cut, 
and they were the the most raw lines. So he would say something horrible, and all the Deadpool's would go would go, oh whoa 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 whoa, dial it back a bit, like like so. Um, all of that was cut. Yeah, it was filmed film. and it was cut. It was in the movie yeah. and cut last minute. So my thing about it, uh, it could there be an unrated or a, a harder R version of this film? Yes. We'll see if it, it... And that's why when it was oldest daughter, nine years old, uh, I think her name is James. Yeah, James. Talking like that at nine years old. If they do it, but uh, there you go. And I do love the speech she gives about multiverses. So awesome. Mm-hmm. That was so great. So um, I loved it. Like I say, the stuff I loved, I loved more. Oh, cool. The stuff that was uh, weak um, stands out as weak but doesn't ruin the film for me. So I stand by our, our uh, non-spoiler review. Um, Yeah. So there you go now. And also the other thing, okay. Over credits, the member berries of all the Mm X-Men stuff and fantastic four. Like I loved it. I loved it. That really like um, they're showing scenes of Hugh Jackman, when he played Wolverine for the first time, <laughs> that was like... so good. So stay for the credits. The post credit scene was a little payoff, <laughs> which is okay. Ties into nothing, but it was great. It, it was, was really good. Well, it ties into the events. It was funny. It ties into the events of the movie. Explains something. So. It doesn't go beyond the movie. No, exactly. it, just, it just explains exactly. something. So, because we go, Alan, do you even, stand by it? Are you changing? Yes. No. In fact, uh, I believe 4DX and 3D is the next my next screening of of Deadpool and Wolverine. 4DX. Oh, what is it you're holding? A copy. Okay. I guess that's all we'll see tonight of that. Uh, maybe continue on tomorrow with it. Uh, also, I want to talk about, you know, later on, see some reactions to the whole Robert Downey Jr. Uh, revealing that he's going to be the next Doctor Doom. You know, he did that at the San Diego Comic-Con this past weekend, so I w- I'm going to cover that sometime this week after I finish my whole uh, weekend, film, weekend film rant of Deadpool and Wolverine. Thank you for watching. Uh, like and subscribe if you want to see more. Uh, thank you for sticking around for a good two hours. Uh, I really appreciate it if you if you watch it. You don't always have to. You don't ever have to watch the whole thing. You don't have.